In the past couple of lectures, I've been talking a lot about homeostasis, the physiological equilibrium within an animal's body. One of the types of homeostasis I mentioned is energy balance. That is, the processes of life burn fuel. So an animal has to take in about the same amount of fuel that it expends over a given period of time to keep its body functioning well. But have you ever wondered where energy comes from? And before you comedians in the audience say anything, no, it's not from that big cup of coffee you had this morning. I'm talking about the ultimate source of the energy used by every living thing on Earth, talking about the sun. We can think of life as the process of converting the sun's energy into food and back into energy again through creating and breaking chemical bonds. Let's look at how that works by examining how energy flows through an ecosystem. Every living thing on Earth gets energy in one of three ways. It can be a producer, a consumer, or a decomposer. Within the consumer group, there are also primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers. But let's just think of them as one group for now. A producer, also known as an autotroph, is an organism that can make its own food. And of course, when you think about a being that makes its own food, you think about green plants. That's the first kind of autotroph. But there are two other kinds of autotrophs. One of these is algae. Like advanced plants, algae produces energy through photosynthesis. You may recall photosynthesis from basic biology courses. Plants and algae absorb the energy from sunlight and use it to convert carbon dioxide from the air and water from the environment into carbohydrates. Now, the third type of autotroph is a little bit different. There are a few species of microorganisms that produce food by chemotrophy. These chemotrophs are very ancient forms of bacteria that live deep in the ocean near thermal vents. They use the heat of these vents to combine inorganic compounds like hydrogen sulfide with carbon dioxide to make their food. Although the existence of chemotrophs was theorized more than a century ago, the first chemotroph species were not discovered until the 1970s. They are strange and fascinating little creatures, and I could devote an entire lecture to them. But I won't, because we're trying to stay focused on animals. So I mention them for the sake of completeness. The autotrophic producers not only produce their own food, they produce food for the consumers within the food web. Consumers are heterotrophs. They are other eaters. And if you think way, way back to the beginning of this course, I said that animals, by definition, are organisms that eat other organisms. This means that all animals are heterotrophs. A consumer that feeds on plants or other primary producers is called a primary consumer. This group includes the mammalian herbivores we discussed a few lectures ago who ferment tough plant parts in their vat-like stomachs. It also includes other types of herbivores like some fish, amphibians, and birds that consume algae, so they are algivorous. It includes primates that eat fruit or leaves, the frugivores and folivores. It includes bees, which are pollinivores, pollen eaters, and so on. A secondary consumer, I bet you can guess, is a consumer that mostly eats other consumers. Here we get the carnivorous mammals, the omnivorous primates and bears, and so on. Tertiary consumers, yes, they eat the secondary consumers. A tertiary consumer might be like the carnivorous lion that hunts and kills its own food, or like the carrion-eating hyena that eats what other animals leave behind. A lot of these are the animals we call apex predators because they eat other animals, even other carnivores. But there are very few animals that eat them. Something must consume the apex predators though, right? We don't find landscapes littered with lion, tiger, and bear bones. The last step in this trophic chain is the decomposers. These are the bacteria and fungi that eat the flesh of dead animals. They eat plants, they eat animal waste, breaking it back down into its chemical components so the cycle can start all over again. What's interesting about this system is that it's not very efficient. 
There is no organism on Earth that gets 100% of the available energy out of the food it eats. In fact, while some plants are more efficient than others, on average, they only convert about 1% of the energy they absorb into biomass. In other words, into their physical structures. Consumers at each level only convert about 10% of the available biomass in their own food into their own biomass. So from the producers on the bottom of the so-called trophic pyramid to the apex predators at the top, massive amounts of energy are lost. Think about it. If the sun delivers, say, 100 units of energy to a plant, then the plant converts it to one unit of biomass. The herbivore that eats the plant gets 0.1 units, and the carnivore that eats the herbivore gets 0.01 units one one hundredth of the original sun's energy. And the apex predator that eats the carnivore gets 0.001 units, one one thousandth of the original energy of the sun. Life on Earth cannot continue without the continuous influx of energy from the sun. But the production of energy is really just the start of the process. From there, we have to ask how an animal obtains energy from the food it's eating. When we talk about metabolism in an animal, we're talking about everything from cephalic phase to the defecation phase. The cephalic phase is the animal's initial response to some sort of food cue. Think of your mouth watering when you smell dinner. That's part of the human cephalic phase. A lot of animals respond to smells, to olfactory cues. Some respond to visual cues. Some respond to both. Again, Think about what happens when you see a photo of a juicy burger or fancy cupcake. The cephalic phase primes the GI tract for the work it's about to do, getting muscles and secretions ready to go. When food goes into the oral cavity, the digestive process may start immediately through salivary enzymes, or it may start with reduction in the size of food particles. In other words, chewing. In humans, it's both. Food then moves down the esophagus, which is basically just a muscular transport tube, and then passes into the stomach. At this point, the stomach adds gastric acid and pH balancing enzymes that protect the stomach lining from the acid. The small intestine is where 90% of digestion takes place in humans and other primates. Food breakdown continues here, and nutrient absorption begins. Finally, Food passes into the large intestine, where water is pulled out of the remaining digesta, and then the undigested food is passed out of the animal. Obviously, these are just the broad details. You've already seen how these processes are different in mammalian herbivores versus mammalian carnivores, and so on. And those differences from animal to animal help determine the most efficient diet for a particular species. In nature, we expect an animal's diet to reflect its physiology, and vice versa. And most of the time it does, but there are some exceptions. And those exceptions teach us a lot of lessons. One of the most inefficient feeders on the planet is our friend the giant panda. It has the physiology of a carnivore, but it eats a diet made almost entirely of tough, woody bamboo. Why is that so inefficient? After all, you or I could probably survive our entire post-weaning life on a vegan diet of all plants or a carnivorous diet of all meat, fish, and eggs. We are able to do this because we primates are omnivores. We eat plants, fungi, and animals in various forms. And our teeth are generalized for these activities. We can slice with our incisors, hold on to meat with our canines, and grind with our molars and premolars. We can digest fruits and juices, nuts and meat in our relatively simple stomachs. Humans even developed fire in cooking, as well as external fermentation that we use when we make beer and yogurt. Cooking and fermentation break down protective cell walls of plants, the tough tissues of animals, and the complex biochemicals in both into more easily digestible nutrients. Bears can't make fires, 
Bears can't make beer, so they can't break down food before they eat it. They also have relatively short, simple digestive tracts, like most carnivores do. There is no place to slow down the passage of food and let gut microflora do its work, as you would expect in a typical herbivore. So even though bears can eat plants, because they eat them raw, the plants are poorly digested when they pass through the gut. We can see the result of this minimal digestion in the bear species. Bears that eat a lot of plants will defecate in large, poorly digested piles, and the fecal matter may even have undigested food in it. In the woods, you'll find undigested berries. In our panda enclosure at the National Zoo, there's lots of undigested bamboo fiber. Bamboo leaves the panda looking very much like it did just after it was chewed. Because pandas get so little nutrition out of the bamboo, they have to consume a lot of it. An adult panda weighing an average of 250 pounds consumes about 30 pounds of bamboo a day, sometimes more. At the National Zoo, to ensure our pandas get enough food, we put 100 pounds of bamboo per bear into their enclosure each day. They also sometimes get other treats, either food that they might consume in the wild like tubers or specially formulated panda snacks. Bebe, for one, sure loves sweet potatoes. That's not to say that pandas aren't adapted to make the most of their food. Although they have a typical carnivore skull shape and tooth plan, they have evolved a couple of special attributes to allow them to make the most of their bamboo. First of all, they have immensely powerful masseter muscles. Those are the muscles that connect the zygomatic arch, that's the cheekbone area, to the bottom of the jaw. Just to give you an idea how powerful these muscles are, they are able to crack through pieces of bamboo that their keepers had to use a chainsaw to cut. That's impressive stuff. The other adaptation pandas have is a sesamoid bone, which is a modified bone in the panda's wrist that looks like a thumb. In the human hand, the sesamoids are little bumps on our first and second metacarpal bones. Bumps about the size of a sesame seed, thus the name. Our sesamoid bones are adaptations that allow our tendons to glide smoothly over the metacarpals. In a panda, the sesamoid is enlarged into a thumb-like projection coming off the wrist. It looks like they have six digits. While not flexible or opposable like our thumbs, the modified sesamoid still allows them a better grip on their bamboo. Keeping our pandas fed at Smithsonian's National Zoo is a big challenge, but it's not the only one. The zoo contains creatures from about 300 species for a total of 1,800 individual animals. We feed carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, insectivores, detritivores, you name it. This huge job takes a lot of careful organization, preparation, and management. So, to give you a glimpse of how the zoo handles all this, I've asked Mike Maslanka, senior nutritionist and head of the zoo's Department of Nutrition Science, to talk to us about what he does every day. Hello, Mike. Thanks for talking to us today. To start off, tell me about the zoo's commissary, where all this work takes place. It's pretty unique in a, in a zoo setting because most of the time, uh, although people may be warehousing their diet ingredients in a single location, they don't have a staff that's dedicated to just making the diets. Um, so the National Zoo has that ability. Uh, so we have 10 staff who are dedicated on a daily basis to doing nothing but making diets and taking care of the nutritional needs of the animals in the collection. Uh, what that looks like is a huge warehouse coupled with a kitchen, a kitchen that doesn't look very much different than our own kitchens at home or a restaurant kitchen. Uh, a lot of stainless steel, um, knives, cutting boards. Probably one of the things that's most different is we have a lot of scales. Uh, so everything we do is weighed out. That makes our job as nutritionists easier if we have to adjust diets up 10%, down 10%. It's a little bit easier to do that with 100 grams of apple than it is a whole apple. Those food items are processed in that kitchen, diets are prepared, packaged, and then they're delivered out on a daily basis. 
So in the morning, the first thing my staff does is load up two trucks. They go out and deliver diets throughout the park, collect dirty dishes from the day before, bring those back to the commissary, clean them, and then start on the next day's diets. In the meantime, we've also got a couple folks that go out and harvest bamboo. Uh, and so they're delivering and harvesting bamboo through the morning, um, primarily for pandas, apes, elephants, um, other animals in the park. For the pandas, you have a big bamboo feeding operation, and that comes from private bamboo groves around Washington, D.C. Where does the other food come from? Surely, you're not out harvesting apples and cherries around the district. Correct. So all of our food is um, uh, all of our food is sourced from a variety of places. So when it comes to produce, we are utilizing restaurant vendors um, or, or supermarket vendors, the same as anyone else would in the district. So it's all human food grade produce. We don't take seconds or donations. When it comes to meat, we're sourcing that meat from commercial plants or we're sourcing that from other USDA inspected facilities. Um, and then come special items, um, rodents, as an example. We actually get rodents from a commercial rodent supplier. So there is somebody who sends out mice on ice. Um, there is somebody who sends out anolis lizards. Um, pretty much anything that we need to get, we can find a commercial supplier to do it. We do pay attention to things like the carbon footprint and how far away this stuff is coming from. Um, but if we need it for the animals, we, we pretty much pull out all the stops. There are insectivores in the zoo collection. Is there a cricket farm somewhere? So we do have cricket farms. Uh, and so, yes, those things arrive to us live. Um, they're shipped via standard commercial shippers. We get them once a week. Um, and then uh, once they come in, things like crickets and mealworms, um, roaches sometimes, fruit flies, they end up getting maintained in colonies at the zoo uh, until they're fed out. I've already talked a bit about pandas and some of the jaw and bone adaptations they have for obtaining bamboo and for chewing it. But that doesn't tell us how they actually get nutrients out of the plant. Correct. So they have mechanisms. So those are the mechanisms that we described in terms of acquisition. Once that bamboo enters the GI tract, the mechanisms and the ability of them to process and utilize the nutrients in that diet aren't necessarily as equivalent as the mechanisms in their paw or the mechanisms on their skull. Um, what we found is that the microorganisms that exist in the giant panda GI tract don't necessarily lend themselves well to digesting fiber. Um, so we know that there are a variety of different um, symbiotic microorganisms for fiber digestion, but they're not plentiful. And based on the passage rate of bamboo through the GI tract, we're assuming that washout plays a key role in, in, in sort of that process. So instead of those microorganisms living in a vat, like the rumen of a foregut fermenter or the hindgut of a horse, there's no place for those microorganisms to live or spend an extended period of time, primarily because of passage rate. So you have constant outflow of microorganisms and you don't have a great way of them establishing that community. So when we look at um, typical herbivores, we don't necessarily see those same microorganism communities and the diversity of those communities in giant pandas. Can we talk about that for a minute? When you look at the gut of an infant ungulate, for example, it's a little bit simpler than the big vat that you find in an adult ungulate. So do we see that kind of a simple gut in giant pandas? Okay, so in an ungulate, you basically have an animal that's born as a pre-ruminant. And so their stomach at that point, at the point of birth, is designed to process milk. And so over time, through the weaning process, through exposure to microorganisms on the mother's teat in the environment, you have these microorganism populations that establish themselves within the rumen and within the rest of the GI tract. And so all that's happening at the same time that that um, 
maturing ungulate is also being exposed to plant fiber and larger stemmed pieces of plants. Regardless of whether that animal ends up change, growing into a browser or a grazer, that process still takes place where the stomach matures into the ruminant that we know. The animal that chews its cud that mixes saliva into the, into the rumen to balance pH to assure that that microorganism population exists. In the giant panda, that same development doesn't necessarily take place primarily because that GI tract is probably better designed to handle the milk that it consumes as, a, as an infant than it is to handle the bamboo that, that it handles as an adult. And that, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a strange progression, but that, that's the progression that, that pandas end up going through. Where does a panda get its gut microorganisms? They probably come from the environment in some, in some measure. Um, we, we don't necessarily know the exact social structure of giant pandas in the wild. It was assumed that they were very solitary, except when they breed. And now there's some information that's coming out that indicates that they might not be as solitary as we thought they were. Interesting. So if for some reason, maybe illness or some other cause, there's a washout of those microorganisms, how do pandas replenish themselves? Transfer between pandas is probably unlikely. And so the fact that there is such washout probably speaks to the lack of biodiversity and the lack of total numbers in terms of the microbes that are in that GI tract. They're, they're not being rejuvenated. They're not being replenished. There are very few places for them to proliferate in a normal in a normal GI tract with a panda that's consuming bamboo readily. Often we talk about the coevolution of the animals with their diet. Can you talk about where, as a comparative nutritionist, where you imagine the gut biota came from originally? In other words, were they just out there in the environment? Were those microbes there eating the plants by themselves and then suddenly they found themselves in somebody's gut and it was a better environment for them? What's the evolutionary thought on that? You're killing me, Don. Was that too deep a dive? Sorry. As a poor, innocent nutritionist, that's a stretch for me. We know about transfer. We, we, we're fairly sure we know about transfer of microorganisms between dam and offspring. We're fairly sure we know about the transfer of those, and, and we're talking about GI tract microorganisms. We're also, we're also fairly sure about transfer among groups of individuals. But when it comes to over an evolutionary time scale, where did those original where did those original microorganisms come from is difficult to say. And it could very well be that it didn't start out with the incredible diversity that we experience now, say in a ruminant animal. It may end up have started that it was only a few microorganisms that established the community, and then the community evolved um, to be what was most profitable for the animal that was housing that, housing that um, population and that ecosystem. I mean, we experience that now when we make rapid diet changes in the zoo. So if, if we have an animal that we, that we switch from one diet to another very quickly, the animal doesn't necessarily do well, but that's, that's the result, that's the outward result of us changing up that microorganism ecosystem too quickly and not allowing the microbes to adapt. Back up a little. How do the microbes get transferred from a mother, a dam as you called her, to the offspring who's got a clean gut when it's born? So when we talk about micro, microbe transfer between um, dam and offspring, we're talking the most basic, which is during the birth process. So we know that there, it's not a necessarily clean environment. Along the way, you know, the concept that that, that process is, is sterile and it's going from one sterile environment to, to this not sterile environment, well, that's not really the case. I mean, there's all kinds of bacteria that exist within the reproductive tract. And then when, that, when the birth process takes place, there's an immediate transfer of um, bacteria. And that, that has positives and negatives. But one of the positives is that, that that's the first part of starting to colonize the GI tract. 
Then the next part of that is um, the process of milk transfer. Milk isn't isn't a sterile entity in and of itself either. There's a, there's a lot of transfer of of not only nutrients but also signaling mechanisms and bacteria via milk. The third part of that, which is probably the one that's most c concrete for us to perceive, is the offspring latching onto the nipple and the bacteria that exists on the outside of the dam that's being transferred simply by the suckling process. So you have those three mechanisms right away. Then you have contact with anything that may be in their commonly housed space, whether that's bedding or the walls or um, a, a feed bin or whatever the case may be. So you have everything that's coming from the environment as well. And so during that process, you have this newborn offspring that is battling things that shouldn't be there, fostering things that should, and you have this ecosystem that starts to grow and starts to change. <laughs> so would the infants be better off if you sterilize the housing space or if you raise them in a kind of animal neonatal ward? Interestingly enough, when we pull those neonate animals out of that system, so we decide to hand rear an animal, then all of a sudden we are so worried about bacteria and the sterility of the environment. And we want to make sure that it's super clean and there's no chance for, for disease transfer. And we may be actually hampering the development of those neonates simply because it's so clean. And what we're learning over time is that the impact of that can be in growth rates or the ability of that animal to appropriately digest whatever formula it is that we select during that process, the inability of that, that animal to transfer from a milk diet to a solid diet or through the weaning process. So we've kind of learned that there's, there's a happy medium between the cleanliness that we want to have in a hand rearing environment and the needs of that offspring to develop normal GI tract function, including that microorganism population. Okay, speaking of clean environments, I want to ask you about what I think is probably the weirdest diet among all animals, and that's coprophagia. And for the folks in the audience who don't know, coprophagia is poop eating. This isn't the animal just being gross, right? It's actually part of how they evolved to get nutrition. Yes, so, so specific animals have adapted to practice coprophagy in order to um, better meet their nutrient needs. In the case of a, of, a, of a newborn animal, when we talk about transfer, from, transfer of bacteria from the environment to that animal in a positive way, one of those mechanisms is obviously through quote unquote contamination with fecal matter when it's really not contamination. It's just part and parcel of, of what happens when animals cohabitate space together. And so what we found over time is that it may be beneficial for us in specific cases to take what we would otherwise describe as clean feces, um, if, if you'll humor me on that term, and, and administer that to the offspring. So what I mean by clean feces is that we, we evaluate that feces. We, we look at it under a microscope. We test it for... Um, the presence of specific bacteria that may be harmful. Failing all of that and not finding anything that would be of concern, then we mix that in, in water or saline or some food item that might be readily consumed, and we offer that to the offspring. And what that does is it gives that GI tract a jump start with the same microorganisms that would exist in the GI tract of the adult animal. And we're finding over time that this has worked in a variety of, variety of different species. The interesting thing is it's so not a new idea. Um, it's been practiced in humans since the beginning of time. Yes, it offends our sensibilities when we think about it, but if we dig a little deeper into the microbiology of what's going on, it really does make perfect sense. And we have some great examples when it's worked in the zoo.
Wow, Mike, this is fantastic stuff. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think in the end, we can say that although all of our energy ultimately comes from the same source, animal diets are as varied as the animals themselves. And we can observe an animal in nature and see what it eats, but that doesn't always tell the entire story. The gut microbiome, those tiny symbiotic creatures living in each and every one of us, play a huge role in digestion, in determining how we get nutrients from our food, and in the end, that means they influence what we can and can't eat. The microbiome is an ongoing area of research in both human and animal studies, and it's sure to yield fascinating and important discoveries for years and decades to come. Have you ever watched a dog greet another dog or a cat scratch on something? Watching animals behave and understanding that behavior has been incredibly important for human survival. Even the earliest known humans needed to know the behavior of animals they were hunting or the animals that were hunting them. We find the evidence for this animal behavior knowledge in early cave paintings left behind by our human ancestors. Our knowledge of animal behavior has remained important through history, and even today, for understanding our pets and domestic animals, for understanding game species, and for understanding and managing threatened species to save animals from extinction. For good management of both wild and domestic animals, we need to know about many kinds of animal behavior. Where and why animals choose shelter. When and what animals eat how and when animals reproduce, why animals live alone or in social groups, and how they communicate with one another. Proper scientific research into all these behaviors has been a huge undertaking. So in this lecture, we will cover just a tiny bit of the history and focus of animal behavior studies. First, let's look at how modern animal behavior studies came to be. In the 1970s, three famous professors were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for developing the modern approach to objectively studying animal behavior under natural conditions, a field we call ethology. Austrian zoologist Conrad Lorenz became famous for his studies of gray leg geese and their instinctive behavior, especially the behavior called imprinting in which young animals instinctively bond with the first objects they see during some critical period after hatching or birth. Lorenz met Dutch zoologist Nico Tinbergen in the 1930s, and they collaborated on these imprinting studies. Tinbergen dedicated many of his own studies to instinctive spontaneous behaviors that appear in full form the first time they're performed. Austrian Carl von Frisch, was famous for his studies of honeybee sensory abilities and communication, including the fact that honeybees have color vision and that they perform dances to relay information about the location of flowers to other bees. Other zoologists, those known as experimental psychologists, most often studied observable animal behavior in laboratory environments. You have heard of the 19th century Russian scientist Ivan Pavlov and his dogs. In studying the digestive physiology of dogs, Pavlov needed to collect their saliva and soon noticed that the salivary response started not in response to the strong biological stimulus of food, but to a previously neutral stimulus paired with the food, a bell. This learning process, an apparently unconscious pairing of stimuli within the animal brain, was named classical conditioning. American scientist B.F. Skinner furthered our understanding of conditioning by studying how actions performed by animals resulted in consequences that were consciously understood by the animal. 
a situation called operant conditioning. That means the animal could increase a behavior in the presence of a desirable stimulus or decrease it in response to an undesirable stimulus. Skinner tested these ideas in a Skinner box, otherwise known as an operant conditioning chamber. In a Skinner box, an animal can be trained to perform a certain action by coupling the action with a reward. An animal's observable behavior was changed by these reinforcing rewards. Although Skinner's original studies were made with food rewards, reinforcers did not need to be limited to food. They can be social interactions like petting for a dog or other rewards like more playtime that are desirable to the animal. Application of this idea by animal trainers leads to a stronger human-animal bond as well as a greater understanding of the science of operant conditioning. Classical conditioning and operant conditioning together form the field of behaviorism in psychology and today influence how we study animal behavior and even the animal mind. Zookeepers around the world use this animal behavior theory to enhance the welfare of zoo animals every day. Nico Tinbergen was the first to suggest that we ask how questions and why questions about animal behavior. How questions are proximate questions about the immediate causes of a behavior. For instance, in my own work in pompous deer conservation, I might ask, how are deer breeding behaviors caused by hormonal or physiological changes? And are these biological changes associated with a change in day length during different seasons? Why questions, on the other hand, are about the evolutionary purpose and origin of a behavior. A why question about breeding behavior might be, why do, breed, why do deer breed in fall and give birth at a particular time in spring? Why questions ultimately help us study change in evolutionary time because we can examine how the behaviors have changed over time in response to environmental pressures and how these behaviors indicate phylogenetic relationships. Understanding how behavior evolves in nature is central to studies of behavioral ecology and requires that we understand behavior, evolution, and ecology. We expect natural selection to allow survival of the fittest. That is, behaviors are favored if they enhance the ability of individuals to survive and subsequently reproduce. Linking behavior to ecology is important because ecology creates the environmental stage on which the behavior dramas play out. And understanding the behavioral ecology of a species is important for its management and conservation in nature. Behavior studies often start with keen observations of animals in zoos where it is easy, then moves on to studying the animals in nature where observing may be more difficult. It sometimes takes one zoologist years of observing animals just to be able to ask good how and why questions about the species ecology and behavior. My own studies involve deer, a unique and critically endangered grassland deer species, the pompous deer of South America. I was interested in two behavioral features, why different individuals were found in groups of different sizes, and why female deer might breed early and often or later and infrequently. So I used recognized hypothesis testing approaches from the science of behavioral ecology. And the first I used was comparison between individuals within a species. As rigorous as I wanted to be, under field conditions, it is challenging to control the many factors that influence survival and reproduction. So, following my observations of relatively seasonal pompous deer births in South America, I used an analysis of an international stud book that detailed the lifetime reproduction of over 120 females in the worldwide zoo population of pompous deer. Still, it was difficult to determine the real driving factors of the broad seasonality of births and reproductive success that I found in the data. My working hypothesis was that one particular reproductive strategy of this deer might be dominant. 
and most successful over evolutionary time. So I had to ask first whether females who bred early in life and relatively often had a strategy that was equal to the strategy of those females who bred late in life and infrequently. And second, did these strategies lead to different seasonality in births? These strategies both seem to lead to equal numbers of offspring over the lifetime of a single female. But this raises the question of whether these seemingly equal strategies are simply due to different management protocols in the zoos at different times, like different diets, different keepers, or different veterinarians. So I adopted another approach, a comparative approach to hypothesis testing in behavioral ecology, which examines species behavior across different species that have had different selective pressures over evolutionary time. For example, because pompous deer can experience serious population reductions just due to ranching activities, I asked several questions that addressed multiple working hypotheses. Essentially, I was asking, for which working hypothesis do we find the most support for our observations of deer reproductive seasonality? I affirmed earlier research results that reindeer have very tight reproductive synchrony in which all calf births happen in a period of only several days. And I found that subtropical pompous deer have a much broader birth seasonality in which fawns are born over several months. I did learn how pompous deer and reindeer are synchronized within a year. Pompous deer with a slight birth synchrony over a broad birthing season and reindeer with a very tight birth synchrony are both cued by daylight cycles in the autumn and give birth in the spring. The relatively small numbers of female pompous deer that could be tracked over an entire lifetime did not provide enough data for me to determine the answer to one of my original questions, whether young or old first breeders also had different seasonality. My results suggested that it did not seem so. But these results did provide support for an answer to the why question about birth seasonality. Deer species are constrained by historic climate and daily weather patterns for births in spring, which drives synchrony of breeding to one gestation period earlier in the fall. The young are born at an optimum time in the spring, so they're weaning at the appropriate time for access to food plants they begin to eat in late summer and early autumn. An alternative predator swamping hypothesis for tight synchrony needs to be taken into account for reindeer that live in close proximity to packs of wolves, but not for pompous deer whose predators are now largely extinct. The observations of behavioral ecologists provide timely data for real application of the results for management and conservation. Knowledge of a two-day period of calf birth in reindeer allows reindeer herders and zoo curators to closely manage reindeer calves against increased rainfall we find under changing climate and weather conditions, as well as better protection of calves in nature against packs of wolves. As we discussed in a previous lecture, knowledge of the broader birthing season of pompous deer allowed me to suggest to ranchers in Uruguay and Argentina that they perform ranching activities either before or after a 30-day period in spring so that pompous deer fawns could have enough time to grow to avoid fast-moving horses and cattle during early summer roundups. But enough about me. Let's return to Nobel laureate Nico Tinbergen. Tinbergen was one of the first to use this kind of experimental approach when he and Lorenz tested the reaction of young, naive turkey chicks to predator images to see if responses to predators are innate or learned behaviors. Many of us have learned the results of these classic studies in basic biology class. If a cardboard silhouette of a bird is flown over the naive prey birds in two directions, the prey birds flee if the dummy bird is flown in the direction in which it looks like a hawk and do not flee if the same dummy is flown in the direction it looks like a flying goose. So these early studies supported the basic hypothesis that some anti-predator behavior is innate. 
other animals are not born with the full complement of anti-predator behaviors and need to learn them. Smithsonian scientists who helped to save black-footed ferrets from extinction used an applied version of the earlier Tinberg and Lorenz study to train naive black-footed ferrets to avoid predation. Let's go out to the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute in Front Royal, Virginia, to talk to Paul Marinari, senior curator at the Center for Species Survival, about this work. What are the greatest threats facing black-footed ferrets? The greatest threats for black-footed ferrets are disease, and that's historically been the issue since the species was rediscovered in the early 1980s. Right now, it's sylvatic plague, an exotic disease that not only impacts black-footed ferrets, but also impacts their prey, which is the prairie dog. So black-footed ferrets went extinct in the wild in 1987, and then zoos and breeding centers brought them back. How did they do that? Yeah, it's a really fascinating story. So SCBI, or the National Zoo, first got black-footed ferrets in 1988. We were the first zoo in the country to actually have them in our collection. It really was the efforts of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department who initiated the whole breeding program. And it was through our work and the science behind our breeding and nutrition and animal husbandry that really saved the species. The species was thought to be extinct in the late 1970s. And it was actually a dog that rediscovered a population in 1981. That population was studied in the wild, but due to disease declined, forcing our hand, having to go and rescue the remaining black-footed ferrets we could find, 18 of which survived to form the foundation for our breeding program. And what has been the biggest challenge in, uh, in breeding black-footed ferrets and then uh, keeping that population going in captivity? Now, there's been many challenges over the over 30 years we've had the species under our care. I'd say the main challenges are, uh, initially it was figuring out how to breed them. Um, we, if you can imagine, there's a species that you think is extinct, and all of a sudden, a dog finds one, and then what do you do? What do you, you know, and, and all of a sudden, then disease hits the population, you have to bring it um, into these breeding centers. How are you gonna feed it? How are you gonna breed the species? So it was really answering the basic questions, understanding the biology of the ferret, understanding that they are obligate predators with prairie dogs, that they're induced ovulators. So it's really important, and that research that has been done by the late Dr. Joe Gale Howard, one of the Smithsonian researchers who pioneered all of these technologies. She translated assisted reproductive technologies that were being done in humans to endangered species. So electrical ejaculation and semen collection, artificial insemination, creation of our genome resource bank has really kind of developed our current practices and conservation efforts for black-footed ferrets today. How do you train these black-footed ferrets for reintroductions? Well, that has changed over the many decades I've been involved with, with black-footed ferrets. Early on, prior to reintroduction, which started in 1991, um, in this building behind us, they actually had uh, pens set aside and did predator avoidance training. So they had, uh, the Smithsonian has uh, millions of, of samples um, and specimens. So they found a badger. Um, they taxidermied that badger and placed it on top of a drivable vehicle and had the robo badger. And they took the robo badger and tried to chase ferrets around and measured reaction time and what the ferret's behavior was in the hope that the ferrets that were born under our care would have the same behavior as wild ferrets, um, which the thought being that the burrow is, is safety, right? These guys spend most of their time below ground in prairie dog burrows, escaping from their primary predators, the badger, coyotes, and owls. So we had taxidermied owls also that would swoop over the ferrets. Now, the results, that didn't work. So we found out valuable information that ferrets, you couldn't use taxidermied badgers or taxidermied owls to train ferrets to avoid predators. So the research then shifted to, well, let's see how these animals do if they're fed live prey, if they're given live prairie dogs, if they're spending time in an actual prairie dog burrow system where they can go underground in a series of tunnels and tubes, um, which is their native environment. So a study was done. We radio collared some animals that were preconditioned, exposed to live prey, lived in this natural burrow system, 
and animals that were just taken from a cage, never saw dirt, never saw wind, never saw a live prey item. And we found that the survivorship was greatly enhanced by preconditioning. So since 1996, every single ferret that goes out for reintroduction goes through that preconditioning process. And where do you do that? Do you do that here or in that, Wyoming? That was, in, that was done for several years here, as well as several other facilities. But now that is being done at the Fish and Wildlife Service's new conservation breeding center for black-footed ferrets, which is in northern Colorado. Um, so the facility was moved from Wyoming to this new state-of-the-art facility that opened um, back in 2005. So all of our ferrets that are going out for release get put in a vehicle, they're driven cross-country, they're placed in those pens, and then the service will determine which reintroduction site the animals will go out to on the landscape. And ferrets have been reintroduced now to Canada, the United States, Mexico. What are the goals of the program in terms of numbers of, of subpopulations within the metapopulation? Yeah, the, 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 re the recovery plan just recently came out, the new recovery plan from Fish and Wildlife Service. So it calls for thousands of ferrets at numerous locations within their home range. And we're currently working on making sure that every state is represented. We currently have 12 states here in the US that were in the historic range of ferrets. We still have Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, and North Dakota left. But ferrets have been released at, at all those other states as well as Mexico and Canada. So things are promising. We have a new safe harbor agreement that Fish and Wildlife Service started that actually pays landowners to set aside certain acreage amounts specifically for black-footed ferret recovery. Um, so that's one of the things that is currently, currently going on. So we're hopeful that ferrets will be downlisted and then eventually delisted. Uh, so the, the current recovery coordinator for the Fish and Wildlife Service likes to equate it to a, a blinking strand of lights that sometimes lights will be on and each of those lights is a reintroduction site, and sometimes lights will be off. So as plague sweeps across the environment, some reintroduction areas will fade out, but others will come on. So it's this ongoing effort by not only the folks here at zoos and uh, breeding centers, but also our counterparts, the biologists who are out there in the field um, at, on private lands, state lands, federal lands, and tribal lands returning this, the species back to the environment. And it is considered a flagship species. So if we can save the black-footed ferret, we can save the 120 other unique plants and animals that make up the prairie ecosystem. The black-footed ferret reintroduction has been one of the most successful conservation efforts ever. And for those of you who are curious, the robo-badger is now in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History collection. Zoologists who study animal behavior have made many of their richest discoveries by first observing and cataloging many behaviors in an ethogram during studies of zoo and aquarium animals. An ethogram is a full catalog of the animal's behaviors. The researchers then take their improved techniques and methods to the field. Having an ethogram to help define field observations and analyze their importance to the animals is an efficient and effective way to begin studies of behavioral ecology. Take, for example, the work of Smithsonian National Zoo's research zoologist, Deborah Kleiman. There's a great deal of diversity in the ecological niches occupied and many differences in morphology among foxes, wolves, and other members of the dog family Canidae. Kleiman's studies comparing different canid species to other wild dogs showed that Despite this ecological and morphological diversity, social behaviors remain similar across canid species. She suggested that some specializations have occurred in group living species, which help to maintain cohesion within the group and to reduce aggression among group members and across groups. Kleiman and her colleagues suggested that these changes in wild dog behaviors and dog postures have been changes of degree Wet rather than in type of behavior. For instance, the bat-eared fox and the wolf have developed different strategies to maintain group cohesion. The bat-eared fox uses social grooming and other contact behaviors in conjunction with subtle postural changes, while the wolf has evolved overt postural changes. These are changes in degree of display. <laughs> 
Kleiman concluded that these differences were related to the different evolutionary ecology of each species. Kleiman